started. Um, thank you all for coming. Really appreciate it. Uh, I'm Ryan Van Patten, so I'm a postdoctoral fellow here in geriatric mental health. Um, so I have some background in MTurk. Um, I presume everyone here is, is curious and interested about it, so I look forward to telling you a little bit more. Maybe. <laughs> These are all my disclosures. <laughs> um, so just a little bit of like background, the goal of what, I'm, what I'll try to do today. Again, I've used MTurk a number of times in research. I think it's a really helpful and useful tool. Um, you may or may not be familiar with it, but I figured it would be helpful to talk a little bit about it to let you know like how flexible it is. You could potentially use it in your research. I'll go through a little bit about what the platform looks like, and then also all the sorts of different populations you can use it for, the research questions you can use it to answer. Um, if you have questions as I go along, I'm happy to answer during and or after, so feel free to stop me. So we'll start with the basics. Um, just give you a rundown of what MTurk is in case you're not familiar. <clears throat> so it was started in 2005, and this is um, Amazon's Mechanical Turk. So um, it is uh, proprietary in that way. Um, it's an online crowdsourcing marketplace, and the idea is to bring together um, human intelligence in the form of what are called workers on MTurk, and organizations, um, academics, people who need um, this human intelligence need to use workers for some purpose. Um, so again, I'll be using this terminology a lot as we go on. So just to be clear, workers are these individuals who complete these tasks. They're called human intelligence tasks on MTurk. And requesters is the term for corporations, organizations who are using the data, using the, the task, the job that the worker completed for some purpose. For our purposes, of course, we're here, we're interested in, in using it for research. Um, a researcher is a requester, and a participant is a worker. Um, human intelligence tasks are the names for what we would call a study, a survey, um, but the broad umbrella term for all the tasks that workers are completing on MTurk. And as will be evident here as I move along, MTurk wasn't designed for researchers. It was designed in the business community. Um, so it was designed as a way for corporations to get sort of cheap labor um, for in, uh, these people, these workers, complete tasks that computers cannot easily perform right now. Uh, but as we'll see, although it started in the business world, it has evolved and is now commonly used in academic research. Um, so I just gave a few examples here. Um, what it was originally used for, and is still used for sometimes, workers might do things like transcribing items from a photo or tagging inappropriate images on social media. Again, these are things that are not yet automated, so we need people to do them. Um, and before I get into more of the nuts and bolts of how it works, just brief history, because I think it's pretty interesting. So the name Mechanical Turk refers to um, this entity, the Turk, that was around in the 18th and 19th centuries. It was a chess playing automaton that traveled all across Europe and defeated many opponents. These are like no, some notable intellectuals and dictators as we see there. And so people were astounded. How, how does this machine beat us at chess? Um, it turned out that it was a trick. So it was not an automaton. There was a chess master that was inside of the box that you couldn't see controlling its movements. Um, and it, again, it went on for almost a century without anyone knowing. <clears throat> so why is this relevant to us? Um, again, in 2005 is when MTurk was released. It was the brainchild of Jeff Bezos, the Amazon CEO. And um, he used this term because um, the mechanical Turk of old um, used a human to perform a task that a, that a robot, a computer, actually couldn't do. And that's what MTurk does these days. We use humans to perform these tasks that um, may, maybe they'll be automated in several decades, but right now AI isn't there yet. <clears throat> um, so Bezos calls this sort of intelligence artificial, artificial intelligence. Um, yeah. So big picture where, where MTurk is at right now. Um, 
it resides within what we call the gig economy. So this is a, this free market system where um, a lot of workers operate for low wages, they're contractors, and they're paid for, um, for working on their own hours and doing sort of odd jobs. So we're familiar with Craigslist, ride sharing, Airbnb. And online labor markets such as MTurk are part of this um, gig economy. And um, MTurk is the largest, but I listed a few of the other online labor markets that are its competitors. It's certainly not the only one out there. Um, and the, these online labor markets are growing very quickly, which is relevant to us if we choose to use MTurk in our research. It's, it is getting bigger, more people are, there are more workers all the time. Uh, so some data to that, it's projected by 2027 that about a third of Americans will be part of the online labor force in some way or another. Um, the industry is growing economically. Um, earned $2 billion in 2013, and that will um, certainly rise um, within the next decade or so, 15 to 25 billion by 2020. Um, and we have about 4.8 million active users these days. So we, we use it for research. It's also been the, the idea, the brainchild um, of Jeff Bezos that was started in Amazon has sort of infiltrated into other areas. A lot of the major US tech companies, Facebook, Google, use similar models, again, for different tasks that are helpful to them, things like programming AI systems, locating fake news. Um, so this is uh, certainly a growing industry. Okay, so that's, that's a little bit of the background and how it started in business, and I'll start to move into research and how it might be relevant to us. Um, so there are workers and requesters. Requesters, about, about a third of requesters are academics. Um, in most of the tasks, the hits that academics use on MTurk and MTurk are surveys. Um, but as we'll see, it's, it is a flexible platform. We can do other sorts of studies on it as well. Corporations are about another third of the hits on MTurk, and the rest are um, private individuals. Um, overall, the majority of hits are micro tasks. So, from the perspective of workers, they tend to complete tasks that are really quick. They don't pay very much, but they just do a lot of tasks really fast and make as much money as they can. More relevant to us are the workers. Um, so. The only prerequisite to be a worker is to have an email address, which I think is a really good thing. It leaves the door pretty wide open um, so that many people can be part of MTurk. Um, it sort of reduces selection bias by saying that all you need to have is an email address to sign up. Um, if we could go, I'll show, you, I'll show you guys this MTurk tracker, which is helpful in terms of, it's the other one, yeah. So, in a moment, I'll get to the demographics. Like, what do the workers look like? We need to know that for generalizability if we choose to use them in our research. And I'll go over, th I'll go over some published descriptive statistics. But um, this tool is very helpful because MTurk is dynamic. There are always new workers being added, and some people stop using it. It's always changing. Um, this free tool. Um, allows us to, anytime we want, we can go on here and check what the demographics of um, the platform are. So, for example, um, this is between a month ago, December 28th, and today. For the last month, if we're looking at gender in the U.S., it's about 50-50. Um, but we could go through all of these different uh, demographics on any day and check sort of where um, where the proportions of different groups are at that time is helpful. Uh, we can go back. Mm -hmm. Is this age in there? Age is in there. Yeah, it gives you age by date of birth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, as of 2015, there were roughly 500,000 workers on MTurk. Again, it's growing all the time, so likely that's, that number is likely a little bit larger right now. Um, the median hourly wage of a worker is only $2 an hour. Um, because they're uh, contractors, they're not uh, protected by um, any sort of, uh, sort of wage laws. Um, 
and we'll get into there's some controversy around that, but um, that's sort of that's how we're able to um, get a lot of data pretty quickly. So the next question that a lot of people have is, given that wages are so low, why do workers participate? The vast majority of people on MTurk are not uh, participating as their primary source of income. Um, so most people, as we see on the bottom, most people are using MTurk as a way to spend free time, make some extra money. Um, it's something to do to pass the time. It can be interesting. The tasks can be um, fun and something different to do. But there is a proportion, a small proportion of people who do use MTurk as their primary source of income. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 500,000 on MTurk and 4.8 million in online labor markets overall. Yeah. So we saw that using the MTurk tracker, we can look at demographics for any one point in time, but the, the demographics are relatively stable. And so I'll run through some of those. Um, Primarily, the, um, the largest group in MTurk are people from the US. About three quarters are American. The, what, the next largest group um, are people from India. But there are, the, there are people from over 100 countries. And about 9% um, 9 of 500,000 is about 45,000. So if you're interested in studying people from um, like an array of backgrounds, then you'd certainly have that option. As we would expect, most people are young or middle-aged. This is the you do need some um, technological know-how, you know, in order to use something like this to even hear about it. So most people are relatively young, but I'm interested in geriatrics, for example. And about 12% of people on MTurk are 50 years of age or older. So we could also study older adults. Uh, workers do tend to have above average educational attainment, so a little over half have a college degree or more compared to about a third of working age U.S. adults, something to be aware of in terms of generalizability. Uh, as we saw using the MTurk tracker, gender is about 50-50. <clears throat> the median household income is a little bit below the average um, in the U.S., which is good to be aware of. For all these variables, though, they're there is good variability. So even there, there are so many workers, and there is a range. Even if the median is a little low, if you were interested in studying people who had especially high incomes or especially low incomes, you could um, specify that for your study and then um, examine those people. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there is uh, some turnover. So every about every seven months, the um, half of the uh, worker pool will turn over, uh, meaning that it is dynamic. There are some changes in demographics and who the workers are across time. But again, there are some, these trends are pretty stable as well. So I've been talking about these characteristics for the purpose of external validity, of course. Um, stepping back and looking at the strengths and limitations of this tool, it's a really important question. Right? If we're going to use MTurk, then uh, we need to know to what extent our results will be generalizable to a larger population. Um, so first, in terms of limitations, um, workers, as I mentioned, do have higher educational attainment. Um, other studies have shown that they tend to be higher in empathy and social anxiety. That part might be might make sense, uh, the social anxiety piece, given that they're spending a lot of their time working on their computer. Um, they tend to have low extroversion, low self-esteem, and there are no data that I'm familiar with that speak to this, but I imagine that they're more technologically savvy than the general population. But there are also several really important strengths of MTurk in terms of generalizability. So, uh, there, there's been arguments for quite some time that compared to traditional convenience samples, internet samples reduce some of the bias. Um, and specifically, MTurk samples, and uh, I would say this applies more to US samples, um, they do approximate US census data. So 
variables like we've looked at gender, um, race, ethnicity, just to a good extent income, and to a little bit of a lesser extent education, you can get an MTurk sample that looks like US Census sample. Um, the, uh, a way that I look at this that I think is really helpful is in the social sciences, um, there's been a good amount of talk about this idea that our, our samples are overly represented by weird people. Um, so westernized, educated, industrialized, rich and democratic in psychology, medicine. Um, it's, it's hard to recruit w without um, overrepresentation by these weird people. And overall, by and large, MTurk reduces the bias in the over-reliance on weird samples. So we are able to get a relatively diverse group of people. Again, the takeaway, there are limitations, but workers are more representative of the general population than typical convenience samples. <clears throat> of course, no study purports to fully generalize the population, but a lot of researchers think that um, MTurk does well in terms of generalizability. So next question that might come up would be data quality. Um, you can imagine if you're sending your study out there and people are completing it in their own homes, on their own computers, to what extent might they be distracted and not paying attention? Are their data valid? <clears throat> so there's a lot of research on this. A lot of people are skeptical, um, which is good. So there's a lot of work on the, the method of MTurk and if it produces good data. Um, first, good test retest reliability and internal consistency. We're able to check that box. Um, overall, if we compare results in workers to results in people that we bring into lab settings, we don't find any differences. So they're generally comparable and indistinguishable. Um, so maybe surprisingly, but but it's been repeatedly shown that attention and motivation tends not to be a problem. So validity checks, um, the researchers have come up with different creative ways to try to sort of catch someone um, being inattentive, and it doesn't tend to be the case. Um, Crosstalk is something that people had wondered about. Workers do communicate with each other for pur several purposes, um, but in terms of independence of observations, which is relevant to the assumptions of some of our statistical tests, um, there, there doesn't tend to be any crosstalk, so we can make that independence assumption. Also importantly, <clears throat> compensation amount, how much we choose to pay for our hits, does not tend to impact data quality, which is helpful. There is one caveat to that, but by and large, um, you can pay a lot or a little, data quality will still be good. So taking all this together, overall, data quality using MTurk is at least equal to that acquired in controlled lab settings, which is good. So I mentioned caveats. Um, there is, uh, well, first, as we might expect, people for whom English is their second language, their data quality tends to be compromised to some extent, or at least a little bit lower. Um, that would make sense. So we'd want to screen those people out. Um, and there is one study suggesting that in people from India who are workers specifically, that data quality may be a little bit lower and it may correlate with wages in that group. So I would suggest if you are interested in that population to uh, read the Littman paper because they have good recommendations about how to um, bring up that data quality to a good level. Do yeah. workers select their Right, yeah, so a worker goes in the interface and has a whole list of hits that they can perform um, with different characteristics, like how long it'll take, what the task is that they'll do. I'll show you at the end what it looks like from a requester's standpoint to set up a hit. And of course, you want to describe it in a way that sounds appealing um, for workers, right? So they, they're scrolling through all the time, they're looking for what might interest them and what, what pays most, like a good time to money balance there. Um, but yeah, they certainly would know that ahead of time. <coughs> okay, I've mentioned validity items a couple times. So on MTurk, validity items are called instructional manipulation checks. Um, one that I've used in that uh, is used pretty common is while watching television, television, have you ever had a fatal heart attack? 
Um, so hopefully everyone says no. <laughs> but the purpose is that, um, so we might worry that people, are, they're trying to make money as quickly as possible, right? So it might just be like clicking through a survey as fast as they can to get to the end and make money. So the purpose of including um, an IMC would be if someone is doing that, you would potentially catch them. These are similar to validity items and psychological inventories and, and other tests. Um, interestingly though, although it seems like it would certainly be a good idea, um, not everyone thinks it's even necessary. So a really important um, aspect or option that's offered via MTurk is um, there's a reputation system for workers. So how this works is that Every time a worker completes a task, the requester has the option of paying them or not based on if the data quality were good. And um, if the person is paid or if they're not paid, that is that information is then stored and that's their reputation that follows them. And uh, workers who have good reputations, whose their work, their hits are um, validated and they're paid greater than 90 or greater than 95% of the time, those people tend to provide very high data quality. And we don't, some studies suggest that we don't even need to validity check them, that they, they'll pass and that it's not necessary. So some people would argue, don't even include an IMC, it's not necessary, just use um, this reputation system. Um, I would definitely suggest using a reputation system. I have still used uh, IMCs in the past, primarily because it's one or two items, it's very fast, um, and I projected that potentially a reviewer would really want, a reviewer of my paper would really want to see some validity of them <coughs> if they weren't familiar with MTurk. Yeah. When you're, um, as a requester, trying to identify workers, are mm -hmm. you able to limit the amount of data that you're Yep. Yeah, so at the end, I'll go through a brief demonstration and like show you what that screen looks like. And there's a whole, there's a whole drop down menu with different demographic characteristics that you can use to exclude people. Like I only want people who are four years of age or older. I only want people who have um, a reputation of 90% or greater, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I think just that there are extra items added to your survey, your, you know, your, your hit that makes it take longer. Um, I suppose you could argue if, if the IMC didn't work very well, you know, if it didn't catch people who are being inattentive, then you might exclude people who you didn't want to exclude. You know? But it's sort of just like a validity item on, a, um, on any other psychological test. I'd say you, you wouldn't want it to take up a large report. You wouldn't want to have so many of them that it added 10 minutes you know, to, to the time it takes to complete the task. But other than that, there's not really a big disadvantage. Hmm. Well, one, one thing that's been said is that once you put one of these questions, then the people taking the hit are going to feel like you're trying to catch them. And the data quality is going to go down. Their there's some, will go down there's the data quality data will go quality. down. Because they're in a mindset where, okay, now you're trying to catch me, so I'm going to give you shit data. Like, mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because it, it, it creates like an oppositional relation with the requester. Uh, at least there's some data showing that. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's interesting. I guess that'd be another reason to potentially not. I think from what I've seen, um, researchers are split. It's sort of an individual decision whether you want to include one or not. Um, so there are arguments on both sides. So now I think this slide will sort of bring home why I think MTurk is really useful. It's two primary advantages relative to typical research are data collection speed and cost. So in terms of how quickly you can collect a sample, um, data collection is faster with shorter surveys and higher compensation rates. So although compensation doesn't tend to affect data quality, if you pay more, you tend to get a larger sample faster, uh, as you might expect. And to, to put that into context, um, a 2011 paper reported that it took them three weeks to collect data from 1,000 people. Um, and in our 2018 paper, in two and a half weeks, we collected data from a little over 3,500 people. So it's really fast. Um, in terms of cost, as might make sense given what I said about how much workers tend to make, 
um, the, so the reservation wage, the minimum wage at which workers will complete hits, it tends to be about $1.38 per hour. To put that into context, um, we used a 62-item, 15-minute survey, and we spent, we spent a total of $0.55 cents per participant. Um, 40 cents of that actually went to the participant, and 15 cents went to Jeff Bezos. But um, <laughs> regardless, 55 cents per person is not very much. So we, we collected data from um, over 3,500 people, and it cost just over $2,000. So although MTurk was released in 2005, it didn't make its way into social science and medicine for a couple years. So uh, we began using MTurk regularly in about 2009 um, to show you, a, to give you a sense as to how quickly it's become very popular. Um, in 2000, uh, speaking of journals in social sciences with impact factors greater than 2.5, in 2011 there were fewer than 50 papers using data from MTurk, and four years later, over 500. So it's certainly increasing very quickly. <laughs> It is used in a wide variety of fields, um, some of which may or may not be relevant to us, but political science, economics, IO psychology, computer science, social psych, medicine, um, a lot of different people have used this. I thought this would be helpful to see because I think it shows the flexibility of the tool, people with approaching research from different perspectives, with different types of research questions, all have found the tool to be useful. Um, zeroing in a little bit on clinical science, um, it, MTurk started making its way into clinical psychology and my area of clinical neuropsychology about six or seven years ago, and this is not exhaustive, just a list of all the different um, potential research questions or populations that have been studied using MTurk. So it may be helpful at this point to walk through a few papers and research designs and how people have specifically used MTurk in this way. Um, <clears throat> as may be obvious, cross-sectional studies and specifically surveys tend to be the easiest um, way to use MTurk, get data quickly, generally pretty representative. Uh, so most studies using MTurk have been cross-sectional surveys, but both experimental and longitudinal designs are also feasible. So I'll start with an example of a cross-sectional survey. Um, then I'll talk about a longitudinal internet intervention, uh, and then a third study that sought to validate computerized cognitive tasks. So we were interested in measuring dimension knowledge in the larger population. So we wanted to comprehensively measure knowledge of dementia, late life, pathological decline in a, in a large sample. The idea is uh, we want to know we want to know how much people know about dementia and identify those gaps so that that can inform educational campaigns to increase knowledge and awareness, which can reduce prevalence and improve quality of life for people with dementia. <clears throat> As I mentioned, we collected data pretty quickly. Um, we used a 25-item validated measure, a few supplemental items around the edges um, to to capture people's knowledge of dementia, causes, um, care considerations, things like that. So this was our sample. Uh, as you might imagine from the demographics that I had shown earlier, most people were from the US. The second largest group were people from India. But I thought it would be helpful to show this, because even though the proportions are relatively small, we still have almost 100 people from Latin America, Canada, other Asian countries. So these groups are plenty large enough for to provide power for statistics. So in a nutshell, uh, we found uh, a number of sociodemographic characteristics that were associated with um, less overall knowledge, <clears throat> young age, low education, less dementia experience, several others. Then we located knowledge gaps um, in specific areas. So the full sample perform poorly on certain items related, relating to cerebrovascular disease, dementia versus delirium, and these other things. Again, the purpose, the idea here <coughs> was to identify gaps in knowledge to inform education, which um, can have positive benefits 
um, in, the, in the larger population in terms of reducing dementia incidence and improving quality of life. Um, of course, my talk today isn't about this study, but I think um, what's useful here is that quickly and cheaply we were able to do this study which compared really favorably to the other research. So there's a good amount of previous literature on dementia knowledge using surveys and administering them in more traditional ways like paper pencil, sending them out to people. Um, we were able to use a longer survey and get a larger sample than most of those other studies more cheaply. So I found this paper to be really interesting. This was this is the first paper that I am aware of that has used MTurk to actually deliver an intervention. <clears throat> and so I thought it would be helpful to run through their methods and how they actually uh, went about doing this. So the aim in this study was to to evaluate the feasibility of MTurk for an internet intervention in people with problem drinking behaviors. They used a three-stage model to uh, recruit their ultimate sample. So first, they used a blinded eligibility screener. So importantly here, these, these are their two criteria, but workers don't know what their criteria are um, because you wouldn't want people to know and then answer such that they can be in the study um, and then bias your sample. So their sample needed, their participants needed to be 18 or older and consume alcohol at least weekly in the past year. So were those, were those items kind of embedded in those larger group of items so that their participants would be live to let them? Yeah, it, it was a, a f like five or ten items and just asking like, answer these general questions about yourself. You know, what is your age? How much alcohol do you drink? How much do you sleep at night? And they, their inclusion criteria could be that you don't drink at all or that you drink a certain amount so that way people wouldn't be biased. So those people who answered the blinded, the blinded eligibility screener were then um, allowed or could then move on to the baseline assessment. Here they took more thorough demographics. Um, they also administered several alcohol use uh, measures including the audit and at this stage, everyone needed to score a seven or higher at the audit in order to be invited to stage three. Also, everyone who completed stage two did receive $1.50 in payment. So stage one, those few quick questions, if, if they did not meet eligibility criteria, they, they didn't get paid. They knew that up front. So uh, we've gone through stage one and two, those people who uh, met all the criteria thus far, were then invited to complete what was called another study, which was simply the, the follow-up uh, uh, aspect of this study. So are you willing to complete this other study in three months? And if people say yes, then they'll be included. Um, they were then randomized to this check your drinking intervention or a no intervention control group. Um, the check your drinking intervention has been validated several times. It's, it's a pretty simple alcohol intervention where uh, you take someone based on their demographics, you compare them to other people who are similar to them, and you show them data on uh, drinking. So if I, I'm a 31-year-old white male, what is a typical 31-year-old white male? How much do they drink? And I get to see how much alcohol I consume compared to how much alcohol they consume. And it does. Um, developing that discrepancy, sort of the um, MI model for substance use treatment, um, does actually reduce people's drinking a little bit. And clearly the authors chose this intervention because it's something that is doable in an online platform versus a lot of other uh, interventions that would need to be done in person. <clears throat> so now we have our sample randomized to control or the CYD group. Um, it, to access the intervention, people in the CYD group were provided um, a password via email, which they could then access the intervention in the external website. And they were paid, which is quite high for MTurk, they were paid $10 for completing the three-month follow-up. So before I get into the results and what they looked like to bring home the sample a little bit more, um, 980, 986 people met stage one, 
criteria. Um, 563 of those did not meet the next set of criteria. Their audit was too low, they failed a validity check, or they just didn't agree to the three-month follow-up. So we had um, 423 people randomized, pretty balanced across the two groups. And retention was pretty good with about 85% of people who were randomized then completing the three-month follow-up, likely because they, they got a $10 payment, which for MTurk is pretty high. <clears throat> the, the author's hypothesis had been that people in the CYD group, would their, their drinking would um, decline or reduce more than people in the control group, as you might expect, and at least per the audit scores, that was the case. There were several other ways they measured alcohol use as well, and using those measures, there were no differences, but at least via audit scores, the intervention group reduced their drinking more than the control group. The primary wrinkle um, or limitation to this study was that only a little over a third of people in the intervention group actually accessed the the that use the password to go to the website that actually provided the intervention, um, which is interesting because that group still reduced their drinking more than the control group. So it's likely the effect was pretty strong and would have been stronger if more people in that group had actually um, accessed the intervention. Again, this was this study was partially designed just to show that we can do an intervention on MTurk. So it was, it's not surprising that there were some wrinkles or um, challenges, that things that were overlooked. Uh, I think there are probably multiple ways that things that the office could have done to increase the participants' exposure to the intervention. So for example, they could have provided a bonus payment contingent upon proof that you would access the intervention, like take a screenshot, of, uh, uh, of this website you go to that has the CYD intervention on it and then send it to us and then you get $5, something like that, and increase that 38.3%. Um, nevertheless, they at least showed preliminary positive results and um, they did their randomized control trial and with, for just over $2,000. Okay, the third study I'll go through pretty quickly is um, this idea of using MTurk to administer computerized cognitive tasks. So as I mentioned, it's very frequently used for surveys, but um, I'm interested in um, testing people's memory and thinking. And so uh, I have wondered for some time if MTurk is, if we were able to really even administer these sorts of tasks using this platform. So what these researchers wanted to do was qualitatively replicate some known tasks in cognitive neuroscience just to show that the effects that we tend to see in these tests that have been re replicated over and over, that they are also present if we use this platform. Clearly there are challenges to this. Um, technical challenges, you imagine that rather than how we usually conduct research where everyone's coming into our lab and using the same equipment <coughs> and the same computer, this time people are all over the place in completing this task on their own computer using different browsers, different internet speeds. And so if we're concerned with very sensitive like reaction time measures, then it could be problem uh, problematic. <coughs> um, so that, that could be a reason why MTurk may not work for such a task. And then, of course, as I've mentioned, um, people, again, people aren't in our lab. They're in their home environments. There could be distractions or um, anything that's pulling their attention away from the task, which could reduce data quality. So their approach was to program the task on an external website. Um, using Java and then simply link the website to MTurk. So most people do this even with surveys. Um, the MTurk user face is pretty, um, pretty user friendly, but rather than programming an entire task or a survey using it, you can simply recruit your participants and then link them elsewhere for surveys and we use Qualtrics or another um, software platform. Um, again, they so they programmed their tasks on this external website, provided a link, and then stored their data externally. 
So they ran 10 total experiments, and there were some mixed findings. Not all of the effects were perfectly replicated. <clears throat> but their overall takeaway was that was to recommend that MTurk is useful, um, that researchers, reviewers, and editors should consider it and consider um, accepting behavioral experiments done on MTurk, and that the data tend to be valid. <clears throat> so one example, the the first task they used was the Stroop task, which you may be familiar with. Um, uh, often how the Stroop is administered is in a paper format. People are um, reading words in incongruent ink colors, and um, the Stroop effect is the uh, slowing of reaction times when we're reading words that are where the ink is incongruent with respect to the word itself. So the blue is printed in red ink, and we say red. <clears throat> so they administered that using um, their computerized format, and as we would expect via other methodologies, they found a large Stroop effect, which at least qualitatively supports the idea that we're getting the same effects using MTurk as we would in a lab. So bef oops. before I end, um, I can show you guys really quick the MTurk sandbox. <coughs> so this is what a requester would see. So if you, um, first, this, the sandbox is a helpful tool because it, it is modeled exactly off of what the MTurk platform looks like, but you're not actually really recruiting people or paying them. It's just a way to play around with the, um, with all of the interface and the options, um, but you don't have to worry about accidentally clicking submit and then paying people a bunch of money that you, when you didn't mean to. <clears throat> so this, if, if I wanted to be a requester and I created a task, this is what the user interface would look like. This is actually what I used for the dimension knowledge study. Um, so you create a title, uh, which workers see in a description. You want it to be relatively brief and also appealing and accurate at keywords because workers can search for different types of tasks. Um, then the reward is how much we were paying each participant, 40 cents. Um, assignments is another important uh, idea. So here the task is my survey and the assignments is the number of surveys that will be completed before this closes. So if I wanted to recruit a thousand people then I would um, have a thousand assignments and then after um, with the one thousand um, one thousand people had completed it then it would close. <clears throat> you can also we can stay there for a second. Um, you can also change how much time you're giving people. Um, you wouldn't obviously you wouldn't want to give them um, like five minutes, not enough time to complete it. But um, then you can also the, you can have the task expire in a certain number of days. So if you haven't reached your 1,000 participants in two weeks, then it just closes and you get the data from all the people who have completed it so far. Um, Auto-approve auto and pay workers, that's how much time you have after they complete the task to check if their data are valid. And uh, if seven days go by and you haven't checked, then it will just automatically pay them from your account. Now we can scroll down a little more. So this part is really important, um, where we specify additional qualifications. So this is where we specify hit approval rate greater than 90%. Uh, if you click on that drop down, um, there's a whole list of different demographics and variables that we can specify, age, um, current residence, um, income, lots of others. So this is a way that we can you know, choose what our sample will look like. Right, so this option here, um, down at the bottom, I've always used hidden. If you, uh, if you use that option, then only workers who meet your qualification criteria can even see that the task is present, which I think makes sense so, because it, even if there's any possibility that someone who doesn't meet this, these criteria, that person could see your task and then want to complete it and you know fudge their demographics in some way such that the, um, 
they get your data. I don't see any disadvantage to using the hidden option. And then you're only advertising your task to people who you want in your sample. Is better status in that mm, Good question. I, I don't think so. No. Yeah. Yeah. You, for qualifications that are not here, you can do what people in the Cunningham paper did, which, which is, um, I'd be interested to talk to them. I'm not exactly sure what this looked like, but they created that that step one, which was asking people a few different questions, not telling them what the right answer is, and then if they answer in what you're looking for, if they say yes, I'm a veteran, then they move on to step two, and you can actually have them complete your study. Yeah. With um, okay, maybe so. Yeah, I haven't actually used that in any studies. <coughs> MTurk, they, they didn't want to use MTurk at all. In terms of university IRBs, it's been pretty straightforward in my experience. Um, yeah, I haven't received a whole lot of pushback um, on IRBs for MTurk. They tend to be expedited, at least, if not exempt. Mm -hmm. Only what they fill out for you. Um, and um, there's no way to get any identifying information, which is good, of course, for IRB purposes. Yeah. Okay, I think we can go back to the slides. So before ending and taking any other questions, I thought I'd run through there has been some negative media attention paid to MTurk um, in recent years, so I thought I, I would address that. I think it's interesting and useful to know about. The driving force behind this is that there are a subset of workers who do rely on MTurk for their livelihood. We saw that earlier. They're a smaller proportion, but they are out there. And based on the reservation wage, how much we're paying them, we can imagine just how um, difficult it would be to survive on these low wages. As I mentioned, they're independent contractors, so um, the Fair Labor Standards Act doesn't protect them. There's no legal minimum wage. <clears throat> so with that in mind, um, in 2014, The Guardian posted this uh, article entitled Amazon's Mechanical Turk, Workers Protest, I'm a Human Being, Not an Algorithm. So this reported on a, a Christmas letter writing campaign to Jeff Bezos. Um, some workers were um, unhappy, not with all requesters, but specifically some requesters were essentially taking advantage of them by grossly underestimating their hits time requirements, which nothing prevents you from doing that as a requester. But as a worker, if the estimated time requirements are five minutes and you're four minutes in, they tend to just go ahead and complete it. And so they end up working for even less than they thought they would because it's taking a lot longer to complete the task. <clears throat> um, so again, it's helpful to know here that 
this wasn't, um, these weren't complaints against all requesters, just that particular behavior. The Wired 2017 article was entitled Amazon Mechanical Turk Workers Have Had Enough. So here, MTurk was described as a digital sweatshop. Um, and this article went through um, strategies that workers have and how to sort of protect themselves. So they rank the quality of hits. They have their own forums that they go to. Um, to they've created reputation systems for requesters, just like their reputation systems for workers, which makes sense. Um, and they've even created programs to identify high paying hits that they can then uh, complete. <clears throat> and the final article I was able to come across was The Atlantic in 2018, entitled The Online Hell of Amazon's Mechanical Turk. Um, the focus here was for people with less education who are living in these economically deprived regions um, and don't have other job options. They might feel forced to provide, to make a living using MTurk. And obviously the wages are so low that uh, that's a problem. So I just wanted to mention this. We should, we should all be aware of it. Um, I think it's, it's an interesting, somewhat complicated issue. Um, overall, I think that people, obviously MTurk is not putting people in um, economically deprived situations. They would be in that tough spot whether MTurk existed or not. I think the fact that it's there, it at least gives them some outlet to make money. Um, but there is a question, to what extent, as a requester, do I have an obligation um, to um, take action here? Uh, obviously, we can pay people a, a bit more. We could pay more than tends to be paid and still pay them a lot less than we pay participants in person and thus um, help out those people who need the money. <clears throat> um, obviously, some of these... Uh, Phrases like a digital sweatshop, I think, are um, pretty outlandish and invalidates people who are actually working in sweatshops. Uh, MTurk is, people do this on a voluntary basis. They can work whenever they want. Um, so there's this element of choice that's important. Um, a couple ideas, things that we could do as requesters if we choose to be a requester. Um, Obviously, accurately estimate your hit time requirements. Don't don't underestimate so that you get more people, but then sort of take advantage of them. Um, pay workers fairly. So if they completed your task and the data quality looked good, then pay them and help out their reputation. Um, and then if you so choose, especially I think for people who are interested in using MTurk a lot in the future, um, advocacy and um, any charity, especially Again, the larger problem is people who are in ec economically deprived areas. That's the bigger issue um, if we want to take any action in that regard. Obviously, that would be helpful. <clears throat> That's all I have. <clears throat> so I know we addressed questions as we went along, but any, any follow-ups? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. What sorts of disabilities are you considering? Any disability. Mm -hmm. Keeps people from working and keeps them in their homes. Yeah. Really. Yeah. That's a good question. In terms of demographics, like the big picture of Turk demographics, I'm not aware of that. Um, so it'd be an interesting research question. Yeah, I think it would be a very um, good place to do a study on agoraphobia, for example. Right. Right. <laughs> Overrepresented, yeah, for sure. Eighteen, yeah, at least you know, assuming that people are being truthful. Um, so, less useful for pediatric research. Did you? Yeah, I thought I'd heard that there's an issue with bots on Amazon. Mm -hmm. Turk. Is that genuine? Yeah, I've read a little bit about that. Um, to as as far as I've read, it's, it's not an issue, especially if you use the reputation system. Um, then they have um, CAPTCHA questions, which are able to, for the most part, at least as far as we know, um, exclude like automated uh, procedures. Yeah. Okay. If it was like for this specific thing, it, was, it looked like bots, but it turned out to actually not be bots. It turned out to people who are using IP addresses in the US. But uh, one way to catch them is to put like an open-ended text 
question. Mm. It's just annoying to go through here. Yeah. But it's very clear, like the answers are very stupid if it's like if it's decent for them. Yeah, okay. Right. But they're just trying to get through as fast as possible. You can also do like retest the same test and then look at the test you test other. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah, there's several different ways, like an open-ended test question, ways to catch bots that exclude them. Hmm? Do you know anything, anything about uh, if you're proposed to use mechanical search for a computer search grant, whether that would apply? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. I've um, I've used it with several small grants. Um, which I think, yeah, that's part of the benefit, right? Because you don't need a, a large grant for it, and uh, um, it's been successful. I'm not sure it's with some of the larger grant mechanisms, um, how successful. What mechanism were you thinking? Uh, like if you were trying to get pilot data um, on, on this for like an NH grant, mm -hmm. or have it have, do like a mechanical search part of it that would, the data there would feed into your like, real right. person. Right, right. It's a good idea. Yeah, I don't have direct experience, but I imagine if you backed up that application with some of the yeah. you know data quality, validity, those sorts of um, questions, and that would uh, give you a good chance. Yeah. Yeah, for the most part. You mentioned earlier that there are other online platforms similar to Enter. Mm -hmm. Right. To my knowledge, they're pretty similar. Uh, MTurk is the, the largest of them, which would be in, in itself an advantage. But uh, I'm not familiar with the specifics and like what niche each one of those um, takes up. But um, I had a list of them here, which I'm happy to share my slides. And there are more. Um, if if there's some like something about MTurk that is a disadvantage, you could always look into other platforms as well.